my name is Steve Kinane and I work as a senior researcher with the Noongar Research Institute which is through Notre Dame University based in Broome. My training is in sustainable development but to a degree I think the work that we do is largely about um, uh, sustainable livelihoods based partly in the Kimberley but looking at a whole range of things about impacts of environment and how people respond to that. Um, but the idea was if we do have an Anthropocene, well, if we're going to respond to it, if it is something we wish to respond to, what are we seeking to replace it with? So the idea of the Sustainocene, as coined by someone else, is that, well, if we are going to try to transform this over a number of centuries, what are we aiming for? So the idea is that hopefully we will create a period or a scene or an epoch where human beings aren't necessarily causing anthropogenic changes that are negative to our ecology, but are ideally integrated within our ecology. I think the reason that I am going to discuss the really good work that communities in the Fitzroy Valley have done to respond to their own issues of impacts on their environment and impacts on their societies mm -hmm. is that in some ways Aboriginal Australia for, for other people represent uh, an example of the kind of trauma that can beset communities, regions, entire regions, and the majority of a population can be, can be living literally in a state of intergenerational social trauma. So in a sense for those communities that have been able to do something really positive and been able to show that they can bring about systemic change for themselves, even if it is incremental, I think hopefully there's lessons there for the rest of society um, and for people across the globe because to some degree Western societies take it for granted that oil will continue, that resources are available. People don't generally have to live without electricity, without definite telecommunications, without good shelter. And yet in our communities, these are daily, if not weekly, occurrences that people do cope with and do have other systems as a means of mediating that. So I think for me, the key take home message is trauma is coming. How are we gonna cope with it? And there are lessons to be found in places that you may not believe would be the case, but they are. Today I want to give a, a brief introduction about our institute. Um, I, I want to talk about the context of Indigenous perspectives of country, which is wonderful to follow on from um, uh, Professor Deborah Bird rose and her wonderful discussion this morning, and of course I've loved her work for many years. Um, particularly though I'm, I'm more interested in exploring uh, how people are taking that context of how people relate to country and engage with it as a response to the kind of impacts uh, that people are both seeing on their country and the social impacts that have occurred within our, our territory in the Kimberley. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge the impacts of the Anthropocene, uh, which even though the Kimberley is often seen very much in terms of its um, pristine nature, there are a great number of impacts and increasingly larger number of impacts in terms of threats from mining and various other activities. Uh, and also ones that traditional owners simply have to engage with. Um, under the current legislation, uh, or are required to as um, traditional owners who, who hold their native title. I want to briefly discuss mainstream sustainability ideals, so I apologise for sustainability experts, experts in the room. There will be a Venn diagram, um, but everyone knows that you can't get through sustainability without at least one Venn diagram. Uh, and then I want to reveal the means by which leaders are working to mediate these impacts. Uh, and I, I suppose I'm also keen to tease out this notion of trauma. I don't know about you, but um, having seen the, the impact of the Anthropocene, I'm quite traumatised. Uh, I'm aware of these things. We're all aware of these things. We're aware of our, our impacts overall. When I was born, I think there were three billion people on the planet. It's now seven. We can't feed four. Um, and we're heading for 10, um, probably, hopefully, by the time uh, it's my turn to leave. So there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot up ahead. As Warumpi Band says, there's trouble up ahead, so you better be strong. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is just to give you a context, and I suppose to back up um, uh, what Professor Bird Rose was talking about. I won't speak a great deal about it, but it briefly describes, or it gives a sense of uh, Aboriginal countries or nations, as they're increasingly occurred, following on from a, a, um, a Canadian approach to how people define territories. Um, but also, largely, we think of them in terms of language groups. Uh, I'm a Maramara from Mirawan country. Mirawan country is uh, top of the Kimberley on the east, uh, and um, Anna is from the West Kimberley, and Bruce is basically owned by Anna's people, the Garajari people of the West Kimberley as well. But we'll fill you in a bit on that as we go. A um, bit about Noolungu, we began uh, 
in 2008. Um, our motto, which came from research working with over 400 traditional owners as a part of a Caring for Country plan for the Kimberley that was completed uh, a couple of years ago, is right people, right country, right way. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It speaks to the kind of ethic uh, that um, Professor Bird Rose was talking about in terms of people's ownership of country, rights to speak for country, knowledge that they hold in terms of country. And so we, we don't operate in a context, in everything that we do, we operate within the context that there are traditional owners, people have rights to speak. And beyond that, uh, when it's not specifically engaged in native title or other aspects, even in terms of social issues, social research, uh, and around specific knowledge tied to country, we definitely need to know those structures. It's not just a case of respect, although it is very much about respect, it's also a case of right protocols and the way of working in country. Um, so we work across a range of things. I mentioned we've worked on caring for country plans. We've uh, also been involved in um, a number of evaluations. A key focus would be sustainable livelihoods, uh, social and emotional wellbeing, or lian in the Yaru term, in terms of wellness, a sense of wellness and completion tied to country, is something that's also a key ethic of our, our work. The key, the key thing about us is we're community-based. We attempt to work always from uh, as much as possible a community partnership. That's not always the case in a rough and tumble world of trying to get a research institute up um, in the remote area of the Kimberley. Um, but our university has supported us in that endeavour and we're very pleased to say that um, we're busy. We have a lot of partnerships across the Kimberley and we're also completing a number of national projects um, and very keen to work in partnership with other groups. Um, we find that partnerships collaborations, uh, working appropriately together is, is where we um, work best. So we're open to have dialogue. Um, here we are. You can see that we're exactly 4,500 kilometres from Sydney. Um, we were asked this by, I was asked this by a taxi driver just the other day and I said I thought it was around three and a half. It's not four and a half. Um, a little bit of a geography for the Kimberley. So you can see these are the towns, or the key towns, and I'll be talking particularly about Fitzroy Crossing, uh, which is uh, located in the centre of the Kimberley. Um, uh, other key aspects uh, that I just wanted to discuss briefly about the Kimberley, uh, you can see that we have um, a very large area of territory. Um, population uh, is roughly around 37 to 40,000 now, of which about 45% would be Indigenous. It used to be not that long ago that it was easily 90% Indigenous. Um, literally in the last 10 years we've seen, if you like, a, a greater number of Gadia or non-Indigenous people coming to our territory largely for work. And so that's had other impacts in terms of, I suppose, if you like, uh, a form of the, the Anthropocene. Uh, and another thing is that we're a very young population. Um, the, the majority of people are under the age of 15, the majority of the Indigenous population in the Kimberley. Uh, here we have a map of the language groups of the Kimberley. There are approximately 34 language groups or countries that people operate from. And within that, there are cultural blocks. Or these have been identified through work of the Kimberley Land Council through the National Heritage Listing Project that they successfully completed a number of years ago. Uh, and this, of course, is how people relate, apart from within separate language groups, people relate to each other through law, um, connection of ceremony, uh, responsibility to specific regions, but also shared responsibility within a cultural block. And so we can see that uh, briefly it describes uh, layers of connection, uh, layers of governance, uh, layers of ownership, uh, and particularly for discussions today, layers of knowledge, and uh, knowledge that's very useful in responding to the impacts of the Anthropocene. Um, just briefly to give you an idea, there's just over 200 remote communities within the Kimberley, um, numbering anywhere between 20 people to up to over 700 in some of the larger communities. Um, but that we don't tend to have large communities, it tends to be smaller communities. Uh, although they're constantly under review, constantly under scrutiny by government and currently um, the focus of uh, a number of reviews between the states and the feds in terms of bilateral agreements. Uh, so many larger communities that were formed uh, came from being previous missions and reserves and Bruce will touch on this particular period of development in the Kimberley, if you like, the start of a, a kind of social impact from the Anthropocene, if particularly with uh, regards to colonisation and westernism entering the Kimberley region. Uh, we also saw that Aboriginal communities formed around cattle stations, uh, the uh, pastoral leases that formed in the 1890s and continued on to the present. Um, have been a, a central place where, to some degree, up until 1968, there was a, 
you know, there was a system of bonded labour, there was some form of accommodation to a degree. People remained and engaged with the system, not out of choice, but there were definite periods of resistance, particularly in Fitzroy through uh, Jandamara, uh, the Bunaba resistance leader. And we see that though over time the community came to um, come to, I suppose, a kind of an accommodation where people still were able to live on their country, carry out law, live together as a group, continue their language, um, although under a, a definite system of disadvantage and disempowerment uh, within the overall state that was being formed around their countries. Uh, 1968 was a game changer, um, not the 1950s in this particular case, um, but with the introduction of equal wages, uh, Aboriginal people were largely kicked off stations, but there were other impacts too, being technology, um, uh, petrol in the form of, or diesel, in the form of four-wheel drive vehicles that became uh, available, which meant that the previous work that was done by cattle using horses was no longer considered to be suitable, wasn't as productive as we started using energy voraciously as an entire globe. Uh, in 1970s, particularly for the people of Fitzroy, we'll see, uh, this also meant that people came in. It was after the 1967 referendum and really in WA, it was only around 1972 that people did receive officially the right to vote um, above a certain parallel, particularly outside Noongar country in the southwest. Uh, and it wasn't actually in the Kimberleys until much later, uh, I think around 1987, 85, 85, that it was made compulsory that people voted. So it was actually, uh, until that time, not even compulsory for Aboriginal people in the region to vote. So we see that um, there were a, a serious number of changes. People were basically dumped in towns. The economy that they had created or been a part of in terms of station life uh, evaporated and people found themselves largely engaged in the welfare system through both the rights that they'd obtained through the nation state but also uh, there was literally nothing else around within those um, areas. So in terms of acknowledging the, the impacts, we can see here, I don't want to labour too much on this, but I want to give a sense of the trauma that does exist within many of our communities, as well as the really positive stories. Um, even though when you hear these kinds of statistics, uh, that we have male suicide rates that are about double that of uh, non-Indigenous people within the region, uh, that life expectancy is between 12 years uh, and 10 years less, uh, 10 years less for women and 12 years less for Aboriginal men than non-Aboriginal people. Uh, that Aboriginal people are 15 times more likely to be victims of homicide in the Kimberley region and that women are 12 more times to be likely to be assaulted. Um, these are serious indicators of trauma within uh, not all of our communities and certainly not every member of any particular community, but a significant minority of people within our communities are finding themselves caught in this cycle of recurrent social trauma, as a number of key leaders in the Kimberley have been calling it. And that gives people a chance to understand both what it is, but also how to respond to it. Uh, as a quick example, here we can see that this is some work that was done by John Taylor from CAPER, uh, and it indicates that, um, you know, just doing projections into the future about the needs for employment alone, let alone dealing with all of the other issues that need to be dealt with. Um, his statement is that governments and industry can either invest now to build capabilities or pay heavily into the future to manage the social and economic consequences. So it's a theme that's, of course, recurrent for the Anthropocene generally, but particularly in the Kimberley, where we're constantly told that we should be engaging in a mainstream economy. Um, many of us do already, and as I've indicated, through some degree, um, through pastoralism for almost a century, people had engaged in uh, an unusual economy. Um, but we've also seen within this conference that the usual business as usual approach is not necessarily something that you want to be ferried towards. So it's a little bit like being constantly ferried away from a potential um, approach that's based in country, utilising your knowledge and your assets of country and staying within uh, a whole range of um, areas that provide you with social capital or being led basically towards the cliff that everybody else seems to be head towards. So you can see why there's a great deal of resistance, but it's not just about resistance. Uh, it's also about people, um, it's persistence. It's, uh, I suppose, a deep continuance, which was talked about yesterday. And the things that people wish to continue, of course, is both their relationship with country, their connections with each other, and the way in which that is a, a holistic and integrated approach that people see value in, that, as Deborah had related, it seems that many Gutia don't necessarily understand. Uh, and you have to be in country, be a part of country, and see the other values that come from it. Uh, this is the Fitzroy Valley. Um, just a quick context before we get to the key issues. 
um, because I'm running a little bit behind time. Um, uh, So Fitzroy is a town that that sort of sprang up when people were kicked off the stations. It's located on Boonaba country, uh, but it also has uh, key groups of um, uh, the Wamajari, Wankajunka and Guniandi, but with links to Ninganamangala to the west. Um, As I said, people were basically, the town sprang up some um, 45, 46 years ago, and uh, at the time had a great deal of um, social trauma that occurred that leaders were particularly aware of. Here's some of the country around Fitzroy. Um, A Devonian reef forms many of the gorges of the country, Wunderba country. Uh, And these are some of the impacts, physical and social, uh, that we can see occurring uh, in the Kimberley. At the moment, even though the Kimberley, as I said, is largely, certainly um, not as impacted upon as places like Sydney, um, there are definite impacts. Pastoralism, irrigated agriculture, water resource exploitation is one that keeps coming back, even though community and others have worked for some time to resist it. And at the moment, particularly in the Fitzroy Valley, we're seeing uh, coal. Uh, in the form of fracking, but also in the form of uh, open-cut coal um, is a a major issue that people are going to be having to deal with. Um, Now, to get to the key issue, of course, the the Fitzroy Valley leadership um, decided that, you know, they needed to respond to these issues. They've worked constantly to keep their community together, to keep law alive, to keep language alive, educate their children, uh, to work to communicate to others exactly what needed to happen. Uh, on their country. They've formed their own businesses, engaged, uh, gone away to obtain education so they can come back and provide uh, services to their communities. Um, These are some key uh, statements from leaders that I I won't unfortunately have time to read to all of them to you, but I'll just read Claudia Carter, June Carter, uh, sorry, June Oscar, many people know about, Um, but Claudia Carter is a Gunian leader. And Claudia's statement when asked about the kind of activities he wanted to do on his country was, I want to grow up my kids, same as I grew up, staying in the bush. You can do study and all that sort of thing, but it's really hard to get this knowledge from our people. You can't get that in big schools or anything, nothing. You've got to be here, live on the country to see the place. You go and you look after your country, that's how you get that knowledge. You've got to be on the ground. And I think to an extent it speaks very clearly to people's priorities, but priorities that are generally often overridden Um, in the kind of responses that government and others have. It's also important to note that in the Fitzroy Valley there's around 3,500 people across 48 communities. There are about 1,500 people in the town, so the majority of people live in remote communities. Uh, The population is probably 90% Indigenous. Uh, Even so, when those leaders have talked about making a turning point in the valley, they've also talked about including gutiers, including non-Aboriginal people in the solutions. So it's not that people are being exclusive. Now I wanted to show you, yep, there are images of Grog, and the reason I'm showing that is this is going back to 2007, 2008, when Fitzroy was constantly in the news because of the impacts in particular of alcohol in the town. Um, Our research institute was involved in evaluations of restrictions uh, 12 months and two years in Fitzroy Crossing and Halls Creek, and found largely overwhelming positive uh, indicators of the imposition of those restrictions as requested by particularly the women of Fitzroy Crossing and then the women of Halls Creek backed up by key cultural bosses in the form of the Kimberley Aboriginal Law and Culture Centre. Um, the restrictions were not an answer in of themselves but they, if, when we were thinking about, when the people were thinking about the future, they'd put in place businesses, they'd started education processes, they constantly engaged in upholding law, women's business, men's business, The Kimberley Aboriginal Law and Culture Centre is a representation of that, uh, as well as a whole range of other activities, the work of the Kimberley Land Council. So it's a lively, vibrant space where the community have engaged and created their own sector based on cultural governance as much as possible. If you like, cultural governance is the founding bedrock. And then, of course, mediating the Western state, which is always difficult. But largely, the restrictions were seen by the community as a first point to turning around and to beginning their road to being more sustainable. So I I won't talk too much about the Venn diagram, except to say that the community, when they were considering sustainability, also wanted to consider, well, what are our approaches to sustainability? It wasn't a word that people had really used. People talked about, never never needed to talk about not considering to be sustainable. Uh, People were constantly putting forward an idea that they wanted to remain in their country and, and make sure that their country was healthy. So it's about healthy people, healthy country. And so to that degree, um, 
the, the key notion that people began to, to talk about was, well, okay, how do we communicate it to these people that are talking about sustainability, about what it means to us? Uh, and that was where um, I came in and was doing some work in the Fitzroy Crossing to try and get, if you like, a bit of transdisciplinarity around uh, what it meant to be sustainable or how you could sustain your future in the Fitzroy Valley. A key issue um, that came up, I'll, I won't have time to go into it to a great deal, but I'll just briefly discuss that a key issue that's come up is that where we're having success within the Kimberley, and that's just in the Fitzroy Valley, but also Kimberley um, Land Council's uh, Land and Sea Management Unit, um, a whole range of cultural and natural resource management industries, uh, activities, it's actually cutting edge, world class, international standard stuff that really gets seen outside of the Kimberley or Northern Australia. But it's actually, we often hear about solutions people are putting forward and so on, and we can actually point to our own region where we've seen this significant trauma that I've indicated to you. And we can see that the community has, if you like, hit that point, made those turns, seen what's of value both within more mainstream notions of sustainability, but realise that the only way that it's going to work, and a key issue here is the issue of scale. I think often, and particularly in the Kimberley even, uh, when it comes to thinking beyond your own region, people are well aware to be uh, mindful of impacts on other people's country and mindful, of course, on impacts globally. But the key ethic, of course, about country is that you only speak for your country. You have rights and obligations to your country. You have an obligatory responsibility to your country and you're linked to other people who similarly have obligatory responsibilities to their country that you rely on to ensure that you can be obligatory or responsible to your country, and so on and so on. So it becomes, if you like, that sense of country and cultural governance isn't just something respectful, it's actually, it is literally a systemic shift that people have been putting in place and seeking to uphold and starting to see, uh, at the moment, things starting to turn around in terms of the kind of synergies, including engaging with the economy. Although not quite yet, it's not quite there, but it's going in that direction as well. So I wanted to raise it, and I particularly want you to go away th with the um, consideration of um, scale, that the community themselves created a Fitzroy Futures Forum 10 years ago. And they saw this as the vehicle of, that eventually when they managed to get things in place where issues of grog, social trauma, and all the underlying issues that the community had, had heaped upon it through a continual deficit approach that Bruce will, might talk a bit further about in his discussion, that they saw that they had to have that long-term view, they had to build the, inf the institutions and the infrastructure based on their own cultural governance, but also understanding the need to realise their place within an evolving Australian state. So it's actually, ultimately, even though there's a story of trauma there, in terms of the kind of data that I put forward earlier, it's a positive story because it shows that in a region where for 30 years everybody wrote, wrote off, particularly Fitzroy Crossing as a town, and saw no hope for the future of the valley, now everybody wants to contribute to the valley. The government like it because it's a good story. The community uh, and younger people are starting to see new opportunities for themselves. And leaders who have been working so hard to ensure that their children have a future have started to see the benefits of that. And they're not only leading the world in terms of cultural natural resource management, but also in terms of other issues such as fetal alcohol spectrum disorder studies, uh, and dealing with those incredibly hard issues that nobody finds it easy to deal with, but that increasingly as the Anthropocene impacts and as our popular population everywhere reaches these kinds of levels, we will all be encountering, if not us, our children and our grandchildren. So I think there are great lessons to be learned from uh, the remote regions about how people are dealing with these kinds of hardships. Thank you. Thank you.